Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hey, everybody. Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you by Listen Up Hearing Center. I help patients to effectively treat their hearing loss so they can remain connected to friends and family and, of course, remain independent. I am very passionate about hearing loss, and the reason that's the case is I lost my brother Robbie twice, first to his hearing loss from radiation to his brain tumor, and then again when he passed away. I'm the E of ENT. I only treat ears. I've cared for tens of thousands of patients with hearing loss and performed over 10,000 ear surgeries over my 20-year career. I'm also the author of a book, Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss, and I have a practice or clinical practice of the same name. If you want to learn more about it, go to listenuphearing.com. That's listenuphearing.com. Uh, we have a great friend of the podcast. Um, he's been on before. It's Dr. Jason uh, Galster. He is the Director of Clinical Research at Advanced Bionics, which is a cochlear implant company. His responsibilities for the clinical evaluation of emerging technologies, regulatory and clinical affairs, and collaborative research that focuses on the treatment of hearing loss through cochlear implantation. The other things he's done, he's a master of many things. He has been an active participant in the development and review of domestic and international uh, clinical practice guidelines. These have contributed to changes in policy and reimbursement while helping out the clinical practice of audiology. He's also in, has supported the development of practice guidelines in audiology in relation to cochlear implants and treating of severe to profound hearing loss patients. And that's what we're going to talk to him about today. Hey, Jason, thanks for coming on. Welcome to the show. Welcome back. I appreciate it. It's, sure, it's, it's good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you too. Great to talk to you. So, you know, I, I've talked to people. I know that there are some guidelines out uh, on uh, sensor hearing loss and um, that, but, you know, it, it is, you know, in the cochlear implant world, uh, that's a fascinating topic as well. As you know, um, there is a big variance of care and how care is delivered. And so, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about clinical guidelines and where they are and what the status is, what they consist of. So, Tell me a little bit about, I'm sure you know the history or background about it or what, what the process is up till now, what's happened. Oh, absolutely. Um, and this is a great segue from our last chat where there were a number of, of guidelines and position statements um, and even requests in, in the works. And, and honestly, even, even there was a, a request for a new uh, reimbursement determination submitted to and the decision to that was only just finalized yesterday. So, so we have lots to talk about. What's that one? Tell me about uh, that. The, well, so yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. But the um, criteria for reimbursement um, with cochlear implants uh, was expanded uh, through CMS. So we can, we can absolutely talk about that. It's a little different than guidelines, but um, the, the short of that message is that now cochlear implant reimbursement um, is available to more patients than ever before. Um, so for the listeners, high. you know, there are different places or where policy or uh, criteria guidelines. So, you know, people think, oh, well, it's FDA approved, which is the Food and Drug Administration. Those oftentimes are different guidelines than the guidelines for payment or reimbursement because the underlying values that are being used to evaluate the guidelines are different, right? So, um, you know, the FDA is a safety... Uh, more of a safety protection uh, thing as an efficacy as compared to maybe on the reimbursement side, is it clinically worth it? Whatever that means, I guess, is a kind of a lay way to talk about it. Um, you're, you're, you're exactly right. Um, but let's, let's get there and start with, with guidelines, uh, which is, is a great question. And when we think about clinical practice, whether you're practicing as an audiologist, whether you're um, in, in clinical practices near ear, nose, and throat physician like, like you are, um, which specializing in ears, which is a shared passion of ours. <laughs> um, That's the conversation. Exactly. The, um, but, but guidelines are, are really um, evidence-based directions, and, and they're not instructions by, by any means, not even really ingredients to, to a recipe. It's more directional guidance saying that the, the evidence that's out there in, in the literature, in, in the research, and in our clinical uh, practice experience, the evidence suggests that th these are rationales that would support decisions that we make. Would you prescribe one thing or 
over another. In, in your case, would you use one surgical approach over another or some of the other considerations? And the guidelines are really the professional documentation supported by literature and research um, that help us make these, these decisions. And development of these guidelines is um, almost always done by expert groups. So people who are practiced in the art uh, people who are familiar with the research and, and clinical space and have shared expertise. And, and the process for developing these guidelines is um, fairly, fairly consistent in that they often start by focusing in on an area that's achievable. So you would never say, let's write a guideline about everything we do. It's simply right. too broad. So you, you'll tend to look at a specific example. And one of the examples that, that we could draw from uh, just recently, the Audiology Practice Standards Organization, or APSO, um, released a new set of. Um, in, in this case, uh, there's a subtle difference here. They're not they're not guidelines. They're standards of, of practice, which are higher level than than guidelines. Um, but the the takeaway is is that it's a similar approach in this group. The, the APSO. Um, released a standard of practice saying these are sort of the minimum steps that we should take when prescribing a, a hearing aid. And they scoped that, um, which I, I was part of this panel, uh, it was, we scoped it to just focus on the prescription of hearing aids to adults. Right. And it's just a very nice example of how you do need to sort of segment out the area of practice that you want to draft your standard of practice, which is the highest level sort of minimum practice standards, and then your guidelines. And your guidelines tend to be a little more specific, more directive, more guiding. Um, but in both cases, it's supported by a systematic review of, of literature. Yeah, so for the listeners, one of the things that's a fascinating uh, byproduct of this sometimes is when these committees are looking at what they can examine, they kind of survey the literature. And sometimes it will also point out where there are weaknesses in the literature. And so even when you do a guideline, you'll say, well, we don't have great scientific, rigorous research to support this or that. And so the other nice thing is, is it's almost like a, a, an overall gap analysis in terms of this field of knowledge, where are the gaps? And so that's a side effect, which I think is really wonderful because obviously these guidelines are iterative, meaning, you know, well, you don't have the literature now and you've got a bunch of researchers. So some of them probably go, hey, uh, I see that that's a gap. That's an area where maybe I should go and try to fill the gap because kind of one of my calls to action in life is to research problems that have yet to be answered. So I think that's an interesting side effect. But definitely it's very rigorous. Uh, both of those are actually rigorous because they're based on the literature. You're, you're, you're exactly right. And, and a tangible example of what you've just described is that this working group that drafted uh, the adult standard of practice for hearing aid prescription, uh, the same group went on to then begin working on a pediatric uh, standard of practice. And now that's not publicly available uh, yet, but it is in, in the peer review process. And one of the findings uh, that we had as a subject matter group, subject matter expert group, um, one, of the, one of the observations that we had, and, and we, we already knew this, it wasn't a surprise, but we often find as we're going through the literature, in, in many cases, when we want literature that pertains specific to children in this case, um, there may be a gap, just like what you said. And so we, we'll focus on the adult literature and as well as possible, uh, we'll extrapolate from it or we'll say, OK, well, theoretically, this this would apply. But it really uh, helps to paint that picture of of the landscape that's out there and where you can can fill in gaps. Yeah, I think the guidelines are very valuable, uh, obviously, but I actually think the process is very valuable, too, because it really, you know, when you look at the end product, like so if I look at that end product, I have a level of confidence of the rigor if I know the rigor of it, if I know um you know, that they followed the typical process, which is call all the literature, review all the literature, see what level of support the literature has, kind of put it out, see what we can really rely on because it's well done research, put that all together, see what tenants or, or uh, things we can support based on that and kind of report that. So it really is like from a, a clinician's point of view, like a kind of we've extracted what we can really say to be pretty well supported by research. And that's very helpful because it it kind of creates this uh, iterative process for us to like, oh, I can jump on and look at these guidelines rather than, 
oh, I want to know what the guidelines are for fitting hearing aids in adults. Let me go pull 350 articles, boil them all down, review them, see which ones are valid. You know, it, it's it's just too onerous. So you guys are doing a lot of the, and a textbooks do it to some extent, but not with the same rigor. That that textbooks are always a, a great reference. They're behind the times too. That's the yeah, other. It, thing. Exactly, they 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 go out of date quickly. Um, I, I I should also mention um, well the these recent uh, this recent standard of practice document from the APSO is is a is a nice reference. Um, the American Academy of Audiology is also a really excellent resource for a broad range of clinical practice guidelines and. The um, the academy um, and I and I should mention that I as in um, I'm currently the chair of research and scientific advisory for the American Academy of Audiology. I, I will be uh, rotating out of this uh, this chair position in two days. Oh, okay. And, well, sure, sure, <laughs> so, congratulations. Thanks for your service. <laughs> thank you. Exactly. And welcome to uh, welcome to Dr. Ryan McCreary from Boys Town, who will be. Yeah, um, I've had uh, on the show. He's great. Really, really fantastic. Really uh, dynamic and uh, doing great stuff. Ab absolutely, and a, a massive range of work at, at Boys Town. Fan fantastic group, and and Ryan's really talented. Um, the the academy, the the AAA, is putting a, a really a renewed focus on guidelines development. They've always been developing them, uh, but it is a volunteer organization, and you can imagine that it moves at the pace of volunteerism. Um, and and I, I really have to say, uh, within the last 12 to 18 months, it's been refreshing to see the Academy put a renewed focus on guidelines development. They've brought in a full-time staff member to shepherd the work. And if, if you were to look at the portfolio, I, I can't really comment on everything that's in, in progress right now. But if you look at all of the guidelines that are in development at the AAA right now, what I'm gonna get from you. Very ambitious, right? Yes, it is. And and it's exciting to see because um, I, I will say that as long as they're developed with rigor, and they, they typically are, um, there is a benefit to having more guidelines available than fewer. Um, and the, there's, the more you have, the more people think this organization is doing good work. You're exact. Yeah, that's that's so true. And then you can cross validate. You can look across all of them and see where they agree or disagree. And it's really insightful. Well, once you get confidence in their met methodology, then you can know that, you know, I mean, I guess uh, I'm dating myself to some extent. But, you know, if you if you went to Encyclopedia Britannica and it was a good reference for one topic, you'll continue to use it because you think they have good research and it's valid. I mean, it's an analogy, but it's of the same thing. Once you become a good reference, people entrust your other output, which is awesome. Yeah. And and I, I think you'll find that that quality in, in these standards that are... So if people are, wanted to look at these standards, what the organization, I mean, I know what they are, but if you would restate them for the listeners, that'd be great. Uh, certainly. So the, the website for the uh, American Academy of Audiology is as simple as audiology.org. And you'll find a le link to, to guidelines um, at the top of the, the website. And the Audiology Practice Standards Organization, uh, that website is audiologystandards.org. There you go. All right. So people should go take a look um, to see what type of work and, you know, if they're looking for uh, some practice uh, you know, uh, information. And the other thing I, I will say, um, what I love about them is, is it, it's a, um, uh, somebody who's trying to research a topic's cheat sheet, right? Because they have comprehensive up-to-date bibliography. So if you want to look at a particular subtopic, you can look at the standards and then go look at all the references that, and you're kind of getting the best references. So that's my own little hack, if you will, of what I mm -hmm. use them for as well. Yeah, that that's that's a great approach. I've done the same thing as well. I I even have I even have a little folder of guidelines on my desktop because they make such good quick references. You jump into the bibliography and find whatever you're you're looking for. Um, one one thing that has been insightful for for me recently is that there there is an independent group right now in cochlear implants looking at developing what's called a living guideline for cochlear implantation and this this concept of a living guideline, honestly, to to me was new, and to audiology is is new. 
there are, there are some medical fields where it's become really well established. And the living, this concept of, of a living guideline means that it's not simply uh, published on a certain date, which is what we've been talking about for all these others. And, and just like a textbook, eventually these things grow out of date, they become out of date. Um, and you need to refresh them. In, in the case of a living guideline, it leverages the, the internet in that there's a version of the guideline that's released, but the guideline stays alive after it's released and it can be updated incrementally. And in fact, you'll have, you'll, you'll have a version of the guideline that can even be specific per region. And so you can have a central guideline and that guideline can essentially have chi child versions or children that come out from it. And each child version of the guideline can be specific to a region. And then the, the, up, the sort of parent guideline can be updated every year and this can trickle down. And so this concept of a, of a living guideline is, is really getting traction and we will see one released in the not too distant future in cochlear implants. And it's, it's something I'm excited about because you'll be able to say with a timestamp, you know, a date that this was the guideline at this time. Oh, and we're going to update it next year. Next year, this section was updated. And to, today we, we haven't really leveraged that flexibility of the internet and creating different smaller versions over time. So it's kind of like Wikipedia. It's exactly like Wikipedia. Right. Yeah, that's a great analogy. Oh, and you can uh, update it now. We're obviously, uh, I believe um, uh, Wikipedia is totally open, right? As compared to this, which would have some sort of I mean, I can't just go and, and change the whole thing. There's some sort of uh, infrastructure or process in the back system to be able to come up with that. But I mean, I, I think one of the things is, is, is that's actually an interesting concept too, because it will plod or plot, be able to measure the incremental improvements or changes or, or thinking, right? Like, I mean, you know, um, as a point of uh, timing or, or historical reference, when uh, cochlear implants were first being really getting traction around 2000 and beyond, we would tell patients who had a hearing aid in the other ear to not wear that hearing aid because then you will practice using mm -hmm. um, cochlear implant. And at the time that was thought to be cogent and made sense. Um, it is the exact opposite now. Uh, we tell people to wear the hearing aid because we know based on data that two ears all the time are better than one and you need to train your brain to uh, integrate the information from the two different listening moda or uh, hearing modalities that you have. So it, it's, it's, and that would be something that you'd be able to see. I think most people though, Jason, to be honest with you, they're just going to snap to the most recent one because that's the one they're, um, but, but be able to look historically and understand why it changed. I think that's fascinating too. Yeah. It, it's a, it's a nice step forward and helps us get around the, um, yeah. Every the, five years, a huge tranche, right? Because, you know, people, sure. you know, uh, and I think the thing, the listeners, what we're getting at is, is say a guideline has 10 sections and nine of them are good. And the at last section, only three lines need to be changed. In the current system, you have to wait five years or whenever for the whole thing to be re-reviewed. Yep. And what this allows you to do is to like say to the group, hey, all this other stuff, we're not addressing that. Let's just look at the research for this particular point and should we change it? And I suspect this will feed into the concept like, if the guideline talked about what Medicare's guidelines were, which it shouldn't, but the fact that they changed in the past few days, the committee would be able to go in, put in, these are the current Medicare to guidelines, and you wouldn't have to wait five years, and people wouldn't be citing stuff that was talking about Medicare guidelines five years ago. Yep. That's very cool. It, yeah. It, when is it's, that going to be launched? And, and what organization is doing it? So it's, an, it's an independent group, and um, I'll, I'll save it for this, this group and, and the press releases to announce the information um well, but, but I, I understand that but to some extent you know it needs legitimacy too right so hopefully it's coming out of an organization that gives it the uh you know a sense of uh, you know uh, a, a all the stakeholders are represented Ab absolutely so it's being developed by an international panel very large international panel of experts in the field and it's a third party that uh, specifically develops living guidelines for uh medical professions yeah I, I you know uh i was involved in the um cochlear implant reliability guidelines um mm. came out several years ago and i will tell you just birthing the first one <laughs> is quite an undertaking i think it was about a five year five year plus process so yeah, because one of the things is for the listeners, 
even uh, you think your vocabulary is income, but you have to actually start from the very beginning to define terms to make sure that when people say a word, they mean the same thing. And, um, you know, and there is actually variation in some of this terminology across the world. And so I think that's the other thing, right? Like, you know, you could have, I mean, I, I can't come up with an example right now, but the British, you know, the British medical system might refer to something differently than the American medical system. And so you, you want the guidelines to be able to uh, be congruent in both uh, locales. That's really cool. There, there are definitely examples where we've worked hard to establish a common language in, in guidelines development because we know that it will seed language in future publications and and such. So that that's very, that's very true. There, there's also an assumption that we that some of these conversations are easy because everybody has the same view on what they the don't. Could oh. be, but that's not true. No, because people have different stuff that they want to get into it that they are passionate about. That somebody else at the table might say, "Okay, I don't," but that doesn't really move my my needle. Uh, and so, uh, yes, and so some of it's easy, even scope finding out the scope of the guidelines is is, is very challenging. Mm -hmm. So that, that that's cool. I, I look forward to that coming out. So that'll be, and I, I think the, uh, you know, you, uh, version one is better than version none. And so you got to get your first one out there, especially the fact it won't be as controversial because people might not be as worried that this lives for five years. That's one of the things that puts a lot of pressure on these guidelines is that they, or I'm using by example, five years, that especially the first version, there's a lot of pressure because people know how onerous the process is to change it. So the pressure results in people kind of having a perfectionistic attitude, which I think is great. But if it's a living guideline, you know, you say, okay, well, we'll get where we are. We might not include that section and we'll get that. You know what? Hey, Ed, I'm using it by example. If you want to get that guideline, why don't you work on it? And we'll meet again in four months, but let's not hold up the first version because we, you know, that, that that's a great way to kind of herd the cats, if you will. It, it it is and and from experience i can say that you if if you're looking at updating an existing guideline you will very often have a conversation and say well we acknowledge that this section really should be updated but it's not worth the the sheer overhead and complexity of pulling the group together and revising the whole thing and so oftentimes you'll let parts sort of go out of date and wait for it to be the entire document to be substantially out of date before you go in and, and update it. And there are just so many benefits to this model right. of the living guideline. Yeah. As we kind of reflected at the beginning, right, there are clinical practices that leverage off of these and access to care that leverage off of these and reimbursement that leverages off of these. So, you know, having an outdated document can be um, troublesome, um, you know, for some patients in particular, because, you know, you can imagine if you were, your problem has an onset, you know, one month after the guideline is released, I'm giving an example, and then, you know, it's clinically acceptable four months later, but you have to wait for the guideline to be updated for somebody to say, yeah, we'll do it for you. That, that could be really problematic on a granular level for a particular patient. Mm -hmm. so, Definitely. so uh, though that, that'll be coming out uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, we'll wait for that to come out, I'm, I'm sure. And so, all right, so we talked about that. So now you can spill the tea. Yeah. Uh, your teaser at the beginning was um, that some of the Medicare criteria had changed, which is exciting. You know, that hasn't trickled down to me, um, but uh, I'll be excited to hear and our listeners will too. So, I mean, there've been multiple initiatives in terms of expanding indications within Medicare. So it'll be interesting to see what that is. Uh, and and so I, I really do have to give give credit to Terry Swole and Craig Buckman and, and a number of others who um, championed the original request to uh, you know to CMS, um, which for for the viewers um, is the Medicare or is the group that decides Medicare coverage, right. um, and so specifically they're constantly reevaluating re natural the national coverage and they analyze this constantly, and so a letter was submitted several years ago to essentially, it's a very formal process, as you can imagine, with the government. Um, there was a letter submitted to formally request that a new decision be evaluated. Um, and, and this group being being led out by the team at, at Washington University, um, the, they, they submitted a letter with the outcomes of a very nice uh, clinical trial 
showing that cochlear implant outcomes were, uh, were quite positive with a broader inclusion criteria or coverage criteria than what was was previously the the case um and so, so i'm sorry Nora, for the listeners that was one of the things i was referring to so the fda criteria depending on your perspective are more liberal meaning more patients qualify for cochlear implants under the fda approved criteria than the patient number of patients who are approved under the CMS or Medicare criteria. So there is a gap between the two. And so I, I assume, you know, not that it has to be congruent with the FDA, but you're going to hopefully tell me that it's been expanded for that Medicare group, which is wonderful. That, that, that's correct. So, um, so specifically now, uh, and I, I do feel like I should read this language sp specifically um, because it is new, um, but the, uh, but the, the quote from, from CMS is that they have concluded that the evidence is sufficient to determine that cochlear implantation may be covered for treatment of bilateral pre or post-linguistic sensory neural moderate to profound hearing loss in individuals who demonstrate limited benefit from amplification. Now that's all along with the guidance that existed previously. Correct. Guidance, correct, yeah. Yep. Um, the, and so they go on to say that limited benefit from amplification is defined by test scores of less than or equal to 60% correct in the best stated listening condition for tests of open sense, open set sentence recognition. Now, previously, that's, that's, that, it used to be 40%. It, you're exactly right. Good memory. So it used to be 40%. And this is memory. It's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> Good experience. Yeah. Um, so it's the, but it's the daily. You're, you're exactly right. It's, it's how, how we all function daily. And so this this really uh, expansion of the reimbursement criteria to to sixty percent is nice to see, and it reflects the consistency and and um, and positive outcomes that we see with cochlear implantation. Um, so the the CMS now has confirmed their decision just to, again as of as of the last day or two, and um, and they have a, a really nice summary online of all the rationale and data points that went into this to, into this decision. So very thought, thought well thought through, very well evidenced, um, and it will most certainly open the door uh, for for many patients who before wouldn't have qualified for reimbursement. And so I I, I would say to our listeners, you know, so I'm not in the day to day production of research, okay. I mean, I clinically practice, but what I would tell you is, is, is these processes, when I was talking about gaps, the first time that we went to Medicare, we, meaning the hearing community, went to Medicare, it actually exposed the research gaps. Like, in other words, we all kind of anecdotally knew that this made sense, but we actually didn't have the research to demonstrate that this made sense. And so that's actually one of the, to me, one of the wonderful things of the outcomes of these guidelines and things like that is, is like they say, you know, I mean, I believe Medicare wants to provide the best care to their, 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 their beneficiaries, the people who are covered. They're not, they're not mean people. They want to do what's best for the elderly population that's covered by CMS with data. Right. And so that, that last thing is the catch all. And so I, I think we're as a hearing community, going forward to create that data. And yes, I agree. Kudos to Dr. Buckman and his um, his group and to uh, Terry Zwollen, who's been a champion, obviously, in the cochlear implant world her whole career and has done great advocacy work. And I admire both of them and, and their work. Yeah, it, so it's it's a very nice step step forward. And uh, the other thing that is is worth mentioning is that this this really is focused on uh, the criteria for uh, Medicare coverage. Um, so, so patients who I'm sure many of who, who you see with pri private coverage, um, we would expect this to eventually feed forward, but this may not align immediately across the board. You're, you're much the more. You're much more. Medicare experience. goes, so goes all the commercial payers, right? And so they basically kind of turn around and say, "Well, if Medicare covers it, we do," uh, and with a lag time, obviously. So, I mean, I think it's a, a wonderful uh, development for the whole hearing health community, uh, for those people at the bottom who, the, when I mean the bottom, I mean the bottom of the audiogram. That's kind of our reference. Um, and we're not trying to say that they're of some other nature, just at the bottom of the audiogram, which means the worst hearing. 
And so those people have the worst hearing. Um, you know, this opens it expands options because as we know, the type of scores you're talking about are people who really struggle with hearing aids. And so, um, especially in noise. And so I, I think it's wonderful. And and the one thing that's I love about this field is it's always evolving. Like we're figuring out new stuff. We're figuring out what the best stuff is. And I I I suspect that's what gets you out of bed in the morning, and it's what gets me out of bed in the morning. And keeps me from going to bed at night and <laughs> every, every minute of every day, but it's fantastic. It's it's really a, a never ending, um, never ending space for learning. Um and and for me, moving into it's been four years now since I've moved from you know, amplification de decades and hearing aids to Co cochlear implants and i'm i'm just constantly amazed by how rich the space is and how much there is to learn um it's just and actually how much there is for us to figure out it, that that's exactly it and and there are all these interactions um between surgical considerations that you work in every day and audiologic considerations and then we think about age and how long people have been hearing or not hearing and it's it's brain plasticity yeah. some of the stuff that ryan's group works on executive uh, function there's all i mean it's it's a you would think it'd be pretty simple but hearing meaning communication the whole comprehension thing is a very very complex system uh to figure out and that's actually what makes it amazingly fun and interesting hmm. Well, that's great, Jason. Where where do you see this? Like, so you know, where do you see this going? I mean, I asked you this question before. Now you're following up because I asked you where it was going. You said I see these standards, and now you're telling me about it. What else? You know, you in some ways you're on the uh, kind of the intersection of clinicians, uh, patients, um, insurance companies, and uh, uh, manufacturers. So you're kind of in that. I mean, kind of where it's all converging. So where, where do you see things going in the not too distant? The, I would say this is this change in reimbursement uh, is opening a door. And, and really what, what it's doing is, uh, is helping people understand, and, and we see this every day, that the, the public perception, the general perception of outcomes with uh, cochlear implants it doesn't always match the reality that cochlear implant um, outcomes, well, they're variable and some people do extremely well and others not so well. Um, in aggregate, on average, and even above average, people do extremely well. And the majority of people, people do well. And, and seeing the support and expansion of reimbursement criteria, I think is a good signal to the general public that they can trust in this treatment. Um, and that for many people that may have been on the fence thinking um, that I do so well with my hearing aid, do I do I really want to move to that step of uh, electric hearing and go through a surgical procedure? Will I truly hear better on the other side? And and this is good reinforcement that in in many cases for for many people the the answer is yes. So go ahead. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, one one of the things I would say about all that is 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 um, our struggle is the difference between audiologic success and patient's expectant concept of success. And so, you know, I've had patients who have a small incremental improvement audiologically who are over the moon. Mm -hmm. And you have other people who are, you know, the LeBron James of cochlear implantation performing amazingly and are dissatisfied. And so, you know, that that is a, a bigger ball of wax, but that that's one of the things I think, you know, we need to really work on um, patient understanding of the process and outcomes because they're the ones who share, do the peer to peer advocacy, right? Like, so happy patients get other people to pursue and unhappy patients don't. And by and large, when people tell me a cochlear implant didn't work, I say, you mean it didn't do what you expect it to do because mm -hmm. I can look at the hearing test and I can see it's working. It just didn't do what you wanted it to do. And so there's a nuance there, right? Because very seldom does it not improve people's audiologic benefit. It's just whether or not the patients are satisfied. And I think that's a huge area of exploration personally, based on my clinical experience. Yeah, agreed. We One topic that we're constantly working on, and 
in these hearing fields is how, how do we measure people's benefit? And speech recognition is is a tool. It's something that we always use. It's our it's our baseline metric, like like we were just talking about. It's the primary criteria here that's used in in this reimbursement decision. Um, but it is a coarse tool. It's it's more a hammer than a scalpel when it comes to when it comes to measuring how people do. And there's there's certainly this element of how people judge their own success. Right. And, well, I mean, one of the things I've come to conclusion is people are terrible at assessing their own hearing. Yeah. Because you don't know what you don't hear. That's and, that's true. And you don't always have a you don't always have a memory of what you used to hear, or if you've never heard it before, you may not have never had a point of reference. Yeah, it, it'll probably time date this because I'm telling the same story I told on another episode I recorded today. But my my roommate from medical school, um, his mother is a very wonderful woman. She was a kindergarten teacher. She's in her early 90s. And I've been saying to him, like, you, you need her to, she needs to get, you know, her hearing loss treated. And so he sent me a copy of the email that said, David, uh, this is wonderful. I'm able to hear church for the first, I go to church and I can actually hear what's going on. And the the, the, in a long time, which is wonderful. But my favorite is, and when you come by, can you please bring some oil? Because my garage door is squeaking and I didn't realize that was the case. <laughs> so it, it shows you the spectrum of hearing that people get that she goes, I didn't realize how much I wasn't hearing. So it's amazing. And what we do is amazing and we're blessed to be able to. It, it is. One of, one of the examples I always, I always like to hear is people say, I didn't realize my shoes made sound. Yeah, or um, men telling you, I forgot that when I urinate in the toilet, there's a tinkling sound. <laughs> or the car blinker. Yep, it's endless. This is uh, Dr. Galster. He's the director of clinical research at Advanced Bionics. This is a, a great topic. Um, and I know it's you know something obviously you're passionate about, and it's not your uh, day job. So I, I really admire that you're doing this extra work. Um, so uh, I, I know it's on the other episode, but if people wanted to get a hold of you, to, where, how would they do that? Uh, every, anybody's welcome to email me um, using my name. It's Jason and then dot Galster, G-A-L-S-T-E-R at advancedbionics.com. So jason.galster at advancedbionics.com. I know he's on LinkedIn too. I am. Well, Jason, thank you so much. This is uh, exciting news um, and it's a really interesting topic and, you know, important work. And that's the other thing I would say, important, really kind of yeoman's work, these guidelines and yeoman's work, getting these movements that are uh, major shifts, but it takes a lot of kind of highly granular work to get this stuff done. And so congratulations to the hearing community and thank you for your contribution to it. And, and Mark, thank you for doing this podcast. I, I have to say that I, I hear people reference your podcast all the time. Oh, well, that's sure. great. I, you know, it's interesting because people ask me how many um, listeners, and I, I don't know. I, I mean, I know there's a way to know, but I don't know. <laughs> and part of that is, is because I want to do it. It's it, For me, it's not a, I mean, that's wonderful, but I also want to do it to explore these topics and be able to, and, you know, it's not what people who listens to it tomorrow, it's this resource is out there. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. And uh, again, thank you for your time. And I suspect you and I'll cross again, uh, hopefully in person, but if not again, uh, virtually on, a, on something like this. Looking forward to it. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.